I've been meaning to make this video for a while, it's taken me a while, just because it's taken me ages to find the time, we'll get around to it. Basically this is just going to be me going through um, everything I have of uh, Protocol, which is the short animated film me and my friend Tommy worked on over lockdown. It's like a short animated type of film, there'll be a link in the description um, if you haven't seen it, but I assume if you're here you probably have watched it. Um, I'm essentially going to go through everything I have of the film, which is most of the files, um, and kind of go through our process of how we how we made the film uh, using all freeware. Uh, so we used uh, Blender, which you can get for free um, from Blender.org. Um, we used Blender 2.8, uh, 2 I think at the time, uh, and then we edited and mixed the film in uh, DaVinci Resolve. This was mostly our mine and Tommy's first venture, both into uh, 3D animation. Um, we we you know, we'd both opened Blender before and kind of taken a look and had play with it, um, but this is the first time we'd kind of done something that had you know a larger goal um, with you know a full uh, short film in mind. So it was our first time doing character animation, it was our first time uh, doing environment design, it was our first time doing blocking um, in 3D anyway. Uh, we both worked together before doing live action short films uh, and some kind of experimental short films that we've made before. This is our first time doing something completely in 3D. Also we were away from each other the entire time. We were um, working remotely, so I was in Milton Keynes and Tommy was in Burgess Hill uh, near Brighton. Um, I was working off my laptop and Tommy was working off his desktop. We made the whole film in around two weeks, I think. Maybe so somewhere between two and three weeks. Um, yeah, if we kind of go through here, you can see we've got loads of different uh, prototypes of the film. Um, and this is from where essentially we kind of every couple of days we took what we had and pieced it together into a basic rough cut so we could see where the film was going and what kind of stage we were at with the film currently. And you know, like you can see here uh, in this, I think this one, there's a lot of like low res renders. Um, from where you know we would just send each other little videos on Messenger, and I would take those and kind of cut them together. Yeah. Okay. And we worked entirely inside of this uh, Google Drive folder as well. So we used um, different folders for organization. Um, we, we kept all our sound files in here. Um, everything was inside this Drive folder. Um, so you can see we've got different folders for like our blends, where we would upload our blends, so, um, so we could work on them together. So if I need to send something over to Tommy for him to do detailing or whatever, I would upload it into this Google Drive folder and he would take it from there and download it. We were both working on really slow download and upload speeds because of where we were at the time, which made it really difficult, especially considering we had to totally pack all of our blend files. You can see they're all um, you know, between 300 and 700 megabytes, um, which doesn't sound that big, but you know, when you're working on 2 meg upload, um, not even that, like, I think I was 0.5 meg upload, it, it's a lot. Um, so we kind of tried to avoid as much back and forth as possible. You know, we would kind of just designate, okay, these are my shots and these are your shots. Uh, and that's what we would work from. Or if there was a character change or something, we would just kind of send each other the node trees and be like, okay, you need to make these changes to your node trees, uh, rather than sending over whole new blend files because it would take forever to upload and download them and then also the risk of textures being missing or unlinked or whatever which we had quite a lot and it was a massive pain in our pain in our backsides um yeah so we had folders that were for cleanup folders that were for detailing um folders for dialogue um and this we, we just worked inside inside of this drive folder we also it's also kind of key to note we barely spoke on the phone either. We did everything basically over Facebook Messenger. We had one phone call, um, and that was our Zoom session with our actors. That was the first time me and Tommy had spoken on the phone. We spoke for maybe 30 seconds before we jumped on the phone. So we jumped in with the actors, and we started recording lines with them. That was the first time we spoke on the phone, and I think the only time we spoke on the phone throughout the whole process, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, I think a large portion of that is we literally didn't have the time. We were waking up working on the film all day um, and then going to sleep and it was just repeat for you know weeks um, 
because of just how much work it required, we didn't really have that much time to discuss things. We sort of, I think we allowed ourselves like two or three days to talk about blocking um, changes to the script uh, and things like that. And then everything else was just done on the fly as we did it. Just interjecting here. Uh, I noticed during editing, I didn't speak much about pre-production or anything um, to do with the film uh, before we actually started making it. So in terms of pre-production, there wasn't there wasn't much. It was pretty much, uh, I just wrote a script. The script had a little bit of treatment. I took it into uni. Uh, I had a few people read it. I did a few table reads with some people, got some feedback and wrote some more. And that was about a year ago. That was about uh, June 2019 when I first wrote the script. The idea was it just to be a, a concept piece. And then... I kind of had the idea that I did really like uh, the idea of the film, especially the reveal at the end. Um, I thought it was just quite a nice um, sort of slice of humanity in a strange situation, and I thought it would be great to make. So I set the goal um, of finishing it by my second, the end of my second year in uni, uh, which I did, which is great. Um, it was my final hand in for second year. Uh, my plan was originally to have it as a live action film with a lot of CG elements. I wanted to do it in After Effects and Element 3D uh, and spend a couple days building a set on a green screen studio to get all the live action elements and then do the rest in CG and After Effects. You know, I didn't really get around to doing that and COVID-19 happened and the lockdown happened and I learned a blender uh, and so I decided to, we decided to do it all in blender uh, and use that time lockdown to get around to making the film and it's great and that I was able to finish that goal. Um, I wrote this script on Write a Duet, uh, which is the script writing software that I use to write all my scripts. I do use the free version uh, just because I don't have much disposable income. So you can only have three scripts at a time, but I just delete them and export them when I'm done and you know rewrite them if I go back to them, uh, which is what happened here when it came around to actually uh, recording, uh, creating the film. I just quickly rewrote it because it was only three or four pages long. I sent it to Tommy, worked on it with Tommy. Uh, there was a point we actually extended it to like a 12 page script uh, and then we just realized it was just totally not feasible to do a film that was that long in the time constraints that we had um i did actually have to get like a two-week extension on my uh hand in to complete the film because we just totally ran out of time uh then in terms of sourcing actors uh we kind of did that while we were doing the film so the film was maybe halfway complete uh when i got in contact with uh john at my uni who is a uh, an american actor and actor trainer he's got a lot of contacts with actors especially over in the states uh he's from minnesota so he has a lot of connections with actors over in the States and in Minnesota. So we got in contact with him and asked him if he knew of any uh, actors who would like to get involved, um, any who specifically had an interest in voice acting, because uh, we knew we wanted American actors for the film, because uh, you know that's the way it was kind of written. Uh, I wrote it with Americans in mind. I didn't write it uh, with the idea of having British voices. I don't think British voices would have um, felt right, especially considering the only British voices I would have been able to get a hold of were my friends. Uh, and I've used them in enough projects uh, and I wanted something fresh so we decided to go for American Actors uh, which was great, uh, John set out some calls and uh, we got a hold of some amazing some amazing actors uh, who are really great fun to work with so we had our lead which was Brant Miller uh, he was amazing, he had his whole own uh, audio set up we had uh, Laura Ritchie uh, I, might, I, that, I might have said that name wrong uh, she was amazing um, and we had Tony Sarnicki uh, Again, I might have said all those names wrong, <laughs> um, but they were amazing. It was really great to work with them. It was really uh, fun uh, working with actors over Zoom. The way we recorded lines, if you're interested, we had all the actors record locally. Brant recorded into Adobe Audition with his audio setup while he had the call on his uh, webcam, I think. Laura used her iPhone to record and I think her laptop to have the Zoom call open. And we've recorded, we've recorded Brant and Laura at the same time. Unfortunately, we couldn't get times to match up with Tony, so we recorded him separately. We uh, just kind of read lines for him and, and in his place when he wasn't available. We were able to just piece them all together, which is a massive benefit of it being an animated film, that we could have all the lines recorded separately and then just piece them together and slot them in where we needed to. And we could also rearrange lines and have alternate takes for things they might have said. So if the film ran over time, we had extra lines we could have used, or if the film ended up being much shorter than we anticipated, we could. it was very easy to cut out lines that were unnecessary, uh, which was great. Uh, and that's how we went about recording lines and uh, doing sort of pre-production of the film. Okay, yeah. So let's, uh, I'll jump into some of the blend files so we can start, I can start breaking down uh, how a lot of it was actually made. So uh, I've got a 3D folder here. 
you notice this folder is also called Space Film. That's because we didn't actually have a name for the film until like the day we released it, because we had no idea what to call it. Um, so we, we were just referring to it as Space Film or Untitled Space Film for the whole process. Um, okay, so this is my local directory uh, where I did all my work, and this is 13 gigabytes. Uh, and that is because all of the blend files in here are packed and also all the textures in here are like super high resolution. Yeah, we've got and we've got loads of stuff in here from just the whole film. Um, but to be fair, it's not actually that much as when you compare it to like a live action short film, I guess, when you're shooting with like 4K data, 4K footage even. Um, so it's not it's not too bad. Okay, yeah. So okay, we had so we had two uh, like do not overwrite uh, blends, uh, and that was for our astronaut, and that was for the spaceship. Uh, if we are looking at my astronaut folder over here, uh, we had rigged astronaut, do not overwrite. Um, our astronaut we got from uh, CG Trader, which I will be able to show you. Um, it's like the only thing in the whole film that we didn't do ourselves was the astronaut model. Uh, we bought the model from CG Trader, but we did the rigging ourselves. Tommy did the rig, um, which was such a pain. Um, I did not anticipate how what, how difficult it would have been. It was going to be to uh, to rig that model. Uh, I'll be able to find. Here we go. So this is the exact model we used. Um, so thirty one dollars it cost us. Uh, so it's like twenty seven pounds. I think we spent on the, this uh, model, which. Is, was our whole budget for the film. That's all the money we spent on the film was just on that model. Everything else we did for free, we were able to source for free, even the actors. This is a really, really good model, um, really high quality from uh, this guy, Alvin. He's made quite a lot of um, really good models that I'm definitely going to be going back to for uh, future films uh, and future projects. Um, and it was made in Blender as well, which is super hand, which, so we knew it was going to be pretty compatible. So what I'm opening here is the uh, the astronaut model, the exact way that we got it from CG Trader. So this is the exactly how we got it. Um, so you can you can see you know it's not rigged. You know if I try and move any of this, it's all separate. And this was something as well that I didn't really realize until we got the model. And I started looking at it was that all these different pieces are separate. You know the torso, the backpack, uh, the safer, um, the helmet, even the visor, they're all separate individual pieces, which for rigging is a massive pain. You want everything as one model, um, and especially considering they're kind of clothy items, they're all overlaying each other, which causes massive issues when you're trying to rig, because the mesh, uh, when you join these together, the mesh becomes really messy, and you need a clean mesh for rigging. Like if I join these two items, you know, suddenly, okay, great, they're one item now. Uh, I'll do the gloves as well. It's like, okay, great, so these are one mesh now, but that mesh is super dirty, especially in these areas where we uh, where those two set what were once separate objects are now joining. They're really messy um, and they overlap, uh, so you kind of get the mesh going over and back onto itself, which isn't what you want in rigging. It just confuses whatever method you're trying to use to rig, um, and it means it, it just worked really well. So I spent, I think, a solid two days trying to rig on this model. Um, if you don't know what I mean by rigging, um, it's where you take an armature. Um, and you basically use these bones um, to tell a model how to deform. So you would just, you know, make bones wherever the model should bend. You essentially build a basic skeleton. Um, and then that, you know, you use that skeleton to tell the model that how to move, because um, obviously that's not already going to be baked into the mesh. Um, so then I passed that over to Tommy, and Tommy was able to crack it. Um, uh, and I will show you that here. 
Um, yeah, so this was how I kind of received it from Tommy. I sent it to Tommy for rigging and he sent it back like this in a blend file and I was able to use this to test it. Uh, yeah, okay. So you can see here the you know, the characters in a different pose and that's because Tommy was able to rig it. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, if I select the rig here, uh, I can go into pose mode and I can move this around. So yeah, Tommy did a great job of doing the rig here. Uh, and this is what we used to animate the whole film. Uh, what you're probably noticing though is that it's being super slow, it's not responsive at all. And that's because it's such a high resolution mesh and being inexperienced 3D artists, we didn't, we don't know, I st still don't know how I would go about remeshing this uh, to be uh, quicker and faster responsive, uh, give me faster responses in the viewport. Uh, so this is just what we did for the whole film. The whole film we were animating this with like two frames per second response time when we were doing these poses, which was super annoying because if you spent ages doing it and then you let go or you misclicked, then suddenly you had a totally different looking pose to what you wanted. You got to go back and redo it. And it was just a super long, super tedious process. So something I'm bearing in mind for the future is finding either some way of remeshing our character model to be lower res and swapping out for a higher res model when we come to render or just sticking with a lower res model because this was so difficult and added so much time to our workflow. Um, so, but a benefit we had to using Blender was that uh, Blender has a real-time rendering engine uh, called Eevee which I'm sure if you're familiar with Blender you know about uh, and this just basically meant when we went into our rendered view we had like a perfect look of what the film was going to look like when it was done. So, you know, we could import our HDRIs and, you know, we could even still come in and edit our poses in the rendered view. Uh, and this was super handy, made everything super quick because we could do so much of our work in the rendered view. We knew, uh, we were like, okay, that shot's done. I don't need to do a pre-render to make sure how it looks. The only time we did pre-renders was when we were testing animations, and we did those using uh, viewport renders. So a viewport render is essentially where you, know, you take your current framing, uh, and you can say, you come to the view tab, view, and you can do viewport render animation, and that will render what your viewport is currently seeing. So it won't, you know, you'd have to waste your time rendering the whole shot with all the textures and stuff. If you're just testing the animation, which is what we were doing for the whole time, because using a zero G environment, it was really difficult, you know, without a lot of reference footage. It was really difficult to tell, you know, with our two frames per second playback. You can see there, that's me trying to play it back. Um, it was really difficult to tell, you know, in real time what our animation was going to look like. So we would just, you know, do our animation, do viewport render animation. And that would just render out a video file uh, looking like that essentially. And then we were able to use that to say, okay, the animation's fine. Um, I can send that off to render properly. Uh, so that's something we did loads. Uh, I don't know if I've saved any of those. I will have a look. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so in my test files, so my test renders folder, you can see here we would, you know, animate it and then we would send it to the viewport render so we could see how the animation was going to look. So this is for, I believe, the opening shot when uh, Davis, the main astronaut here, uh, turns around. Uh, that is before camera work as well. Um, so that is this opening shot uh, here, this wide shot where he turns around there. That is this shot here. Obviously not final and before camera work. Uh, and yeah, I've got loads of these. Oh, that's actually, these are all the same shots. <laughs> got a bit here, I think, where he comes to pass. Yeah, and so that's that's how we did that. There you go, so that's uh, that was our placeholder for a ship. We just put like a giant sphere while we were still working on the ship. Um, Cool. We've also got a bunch of still tests so we could see how um, things were looking in stills before we uh, 
came around to doing the final renders. So like this was us. This was me testing how the lights would appear on his helmet because the lights weren't there in the original file. We we put those lights in on his helmet. So that's me testing how they would look. Uh, that was our test of the Earth. Um, spoilers: uh, the Earth is dead in the film. That's kind of the reveal at the end. Is that they're stuck and stranded on this spaceship? They you know they can't go back to the the dead Earth. There we go, we've got some test renders of the opening uh, spaceship shot where the camera is flying through the ship. That's what that looks like. Uh, got a few of them. Some tests of what the actual spaceship looks like, it's just in stills. Whole bunch of these. Cool, I'm glad I've got some of them. Uh, okay, so yeah, so once we had the model then rigged, uh, it, we kind of. I made a new. Uh, made a new blend file called rigged astronaut do not overwrite and this was the rigged astronaut that we kind of just kept as a basis not for overwriting um just in a really basic pose we you know with the final shaders that we we're going to be using because um, a really 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 handy thing with blender that we use all the time is the ability to append and link other blend files yeah, similar to in the adobe creative suite how you can uh link after effects compositions and stuff you can take another blend file and say, I want this piece from this blend file in this blend file. So in this case, um, I can show you actually. Uh, close this one down. If I open a new file here, uh, I can just say, this is really annoying me. All the files I'm opening aren't <laughs> staying to my window size. Uh, if, yeah, so I can say file. Uh, append uh, and then go to that astronaut uh, and just import everything from here and then there we go I've got my rigged astronaut from that blend file with all the textures linked already with uh, all the updated stuff that we do in that blend file here so you know if I've done a scene here that's got my spaceship in then I can just add the astronaut in and start animating it. I don't have to re-rig it or re-add textures or anything. I can just link the other blend file, which is super, super handy. And we do that all the time. Uh, so we had, yeah, we had that one for our astronaut. Uh, and we had another one for the spaceship model, uh, which again, like I said, the only thing we didn't do in the film was the astronaut model, because we just, there was no way in a million years I could do a model like that. Um, but I could do the spaceship model. So I modeled the spaceship, uh, which is, okay, let's follow the station model. Uh, station model, base scene, uh, no override. So this was our base scene for all of our blend files because uh, it had our spaceship in it that was all textured up and stuff. So I modeled this whole spaceship myself. Uh, I did this in about a day uh, and then I revisited it and add new things and uh, I did some very, very, very basic texturing on it. Uh, yeah, so I did like a really base metal texture, um, a really basic uh, paint texture on some of these. Um, uh, yeah, basically really basic colors, just just colors. I didn't do much else, and then I sent that off to Tommy for detailing uh, while I worked on some other stuff. And he went through and added in these uh, logos, the NASA logos, and he did some uh, more developed textures. So. Uh, that's just loaded in there at the edge. Um, this kind of spacey uh, material there at the end. He did this solar panel texture. Yeah, but I did most of the modeling was done by me. Uh, uh, something that I found super helpful while doing the modeling for the station was an add-on called Biogen by Curtis Holt, who's a great Blender YouTuber. Um, if you're into Blender, you should definitely be watching his content. He makes great add-ons and he makes great uh, videos on Blender. Yeah, so uh, that's what we used as our station model. And then from there, it was essentially just like a jigsaw puzzle. We just took the different pieces, uh, you know, the, the astronaut and the space station model, using those different pieces, um, just pushing them together and animating them to fit the right shots. Uh, I think in the end, we had about 15 maybe different blend files that covered all the different shots. Um, because thankfully one blend file allows you to do multiple camera angles. You can create multiple cameras and you can use markers to switch between those cameras, um, which I can show you. And that's how we did 
how we merge a lot of our shots together and save us a lot of time by being able to do quick, you know, where we have multiple shots of the same thing. Uh, we could just use multiple cameras in the same scene rather than having to duplicate the scene, create a new camera and, you know, maybe reanimate stuff. We could just animate it once and then choose our different cameras. Um, technically, if we wanted to, we could have done that for the whole film. We could just use one blend file, done the whole animation, um, and then just use loads of cameras, but I think it would have just absolutely fucking killed our memory. Um, yeah, so, like, where I've got this cube here, if I make another camera, uh, so I've got yeah, so I've got two cameras here. What I can do is I can, in my timeline, uh, create a marker, uh, and with the one camera selected, uh, bind that camera to the marker, and you see that changes to a. Uh, camera icon, and if I go 10 frames down the line, so that's my other camera, and do the same thing. Then in my camera view, when it gets that frame, it will cut to that camera. So we use that for switching between cameras all the time. Uh, another camera technique that we used loads uh, was uh, using uh, different objects for tracking. So Instead of having to animate what our camera was looking at all the time, uh, we can use a constraint in the camera, um, a track to constraint, uh, and select that to our astronaut. In this case, you know the cube. And then what that means is, you know, as we move the cube, the camera will just automatically follow it. So we could just, you know, uh, do very basic animation on the camera. Uh, and whatever we did, oops, whatever we did, it will, uh, you know, stay focused on the cube, so I don't have to go through and re-rotate the camera. So that saves loads of time um, in camera animation and stuff like that. Uh, and you'll see that uh, if I go to if I go to my final folder here. Let me just open up a random shot. Yeah, so this is like an opening shot here. So we've got the station over there. Uh, and you'll see what I meant about uh, our playback as well. We kind of just had to jump to a frame and hope it was kind of what we were looking for. Um, so yeah, so our camera here is using a... Uh, let's change something again. It's using a track to constraint uh, to follow a empty I believe yeah this empty here which uh, we animated around the astronaut um, so we had a bit more control of what the camera was looking at we could just animate the empty and we knew that the where the empty was positioned that's where the camera would be looking uh, and then the camera is also on a curve uh, yeah, which you can just create you can just create a bezier curve for that uh, and it's animated to follow the path of that Bezier curve. So that's yeah, that's kind of how we did a lot of camera animation. We'd create a curve, and we would like we would say that's the curve we want the camera to follow, um, and then we would create a null uh, that the camera would track. So it works you know, very much the same way you would do real camera animation. Uh, you put it on a body track, and you have an operator tracking things, and you can just automate that process. It's pretty much the whole process. We just did that for the whole film, you know. Uh, it's it's not much more than that. Uh, every shot is going to be pretty much the same thing now that I've kind of. So again, you know, we've got so here we've got two cameras in our scene. Oh, a lot more than that actually. We've got one, two. Yeah. So we've got four cameras in this scene. Uh, we're using markers down at the bottom. You can see to uh, control those. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Uh, uh, um, yeah, so that's basically how we did every shot in the film, was we had uh, 
kind of a basis for a basis for blocking in our heads that we would sometimes maybe use a cube uh, to follow through with, you know, we would use the cube to animate where we wanted the astronaut to be, and then we would replace it with the actual astronaut model sometimes. Um, just do basic blocking like that. And then just throw in our cameras, or the cameras would already be there uh, from when we did it with a cube. The rest of it was just organization, really. Um, and we did that with uh, this shot list here, which we use Google Sheets for. So we both had access to this Google Sheets document, this spreadsheet, and we would just update this uh, as we went through the film. Uh, so it was very kind of, it was very dopamine inducing as well because uh, I had it so. Okay. Um, Every shot had its own code, uh, and a lot of these actually ended up being the same shots. So, like, I think these are all the same shot, all the same blend. These are all the same blend. I think these are the same blend. Um, yeah, so they're categorized by sort of scene. Um, not really scene, because it's only a one scene film, pretty much, but by similarity, so of what Davis was doing at the time. So, anything of him, so like here, reaching the heat sink. We knew we wanted four camera shots of him doing that, uh, and they're described here, they're given their code here, and then they're designated to an artist here. We've got progress, whether it's done. Uh, uh, yeah. You can see we didn't actually finish off the spreadsheet as well. Uh, I can tell you we did have one issue uh, during the film, was about halfway through we realized that we work on different scales. Uh, in all of Tommy's shots, the ship was huge, like it was really, really massive, and Davis was kind of climbing over it a lot more. Um, in my shots, the ship was a lot smaller, uh, and you know, it was much easier for him to get from one side to the other, whereas in Tommy's, it was much more of an event because it, the ship was much, much larger. Thankfully, most of my shots were the ones where he was climbing and jumping over the station. I was able to go through and just rescale the ship uh, and thankfully they matched up really well. It could have been a massive issue where the scale was really off. Uh, we did test it to see if we didn't have to do the work of rescaling it and most people we showed it to didn't notice. Uh, there were a few people who said, oh that looks a bit weird, the scale's off um, from shot to shot and so we decided it's best just to go through and uh, rescale it, which we did, uh, or I did. And it came out really well, actually. Uh, there's only one shot, I think, in the final film where, where I couldn't get the animation to quite match. And I can show you that here. Yeah, so this was all rescaled. So I animated this totally, definitely, essentially twice. I animated it once as a smaller ship, and then when the ship had to get larger, I kind of reanimated it again. But this shot here, that his hands don't actually really touch anything. They don't he doesn't actually push off anything, um, especially his right hand. You can really tell that he's not actually touching anything. And he kind of just pushes off of nothing. Uh, and that's the only time you could you could tell that it kind of messed up on scale. Uh, something I did that actually really really helped that issue was um, I used a you can see here in this blend file I used a control null for the astronaut. All of the position animation that I did so astronaut moves from one location to another um, all of that animation was done on the null uh, which was parented sorry which the astronaut was parented to so wherever I moved this null wherever I moved this null that's where the astronaut moved and that's how all of the location position uh, animation was done which meant thankfully when it came to rescaling the ship in like six of the blend files um, about like 15 different shots. All I had to do was reanimate that null and all of Davis's animation of him actually moving and stuff translate perfectly. Um, I hadn't done his his personal movements directly related to his position. Um, I did it because I did the position using the null. Um, and I did that just for time saving for me because I didn't like animating position through prose mode and it turned out to be an absolute godsend uh, when it came to rescaling it. So that's something I'd recommend if you're doing character animation, uh, anything to do with like positional movement, uh, maybe use a, use a control null. Um, 
or an, sorry, it's an empty. I would say null because of After Effects, but uh, Shift A, empty plane axes. Use one of them as a control uh, for large animations and stuff because it could end up saving loads of time where you don't have to reanimate a whole character. You can just reanimate the null. It might turn out that's actually an animation standard thing. I don't know. No, I just stumbled across. I'll wrap it up there. I'll wrap up here just because uh, I don't know much much else I can go over. Uh, I don't know how long this video is going to be. I'm going to hopefully try and cut it down to be maybe 10 to 15 minutes, so all the information I've thrown in. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you haven't seen Protocol, uh, please head over to the uh, Basic Scene YouTube channel and give it a watch. Uh, a like would be really appreciated. Uh, also, I'm trying to do more blended stuff on my own YouTube channel here, uh, so a like and a subscribe over here would really mean a lot. Um, I stream uh, at the moment about every two weeks. Um, I do about an hour long stream breaking down stuff that I post on my Instagram, which you can uh, follow me over uh, at Harrison Bailey. Uh, I post a blend of stuff over there and occasionally, uh, yeah, I stream and break down how I made those things. Um, so if you're interested, uh, subscribe, follow along. Um, I hope to see you in more content I make in the future. Cheers.